recruited in the party bureaucracy many agencies that the New Deal picked up from 1933 to 1937. For example, the Social Security law and many federal health and labor laws were modeled on such new federal legislation on Wisconsin's progressive experiment. Can I jump in yeah, here? Yeah, go ahead. All right. I would just like to say a couple things about um, Bob LaFollette. Good. Fighting Bob LaFollette, they called him. Right. Um, and, and thank you for the, the rundown. I know that you're about to move on to Dewey, but I just wanted to get my fill Good. Go of ahead. Uh, Bob LaFollette uh, before we leave him here. So Bob LaFollette was one of the probably the most important figure in Wisconsin history and one of the most important uh, political figures in the 20th century in the United States. Um, he was a reform governor. Right. And he, uh, he, was one of, he was actually one of the first people to use the term progressive to self-identify. Okay. Um, he started off as a district attorney in the state of Wisconsin. Right. Uh, and then a United States congressman as a Republican. He was mostly anti-war and for the people, and the problems that he faced at that time in the late 19th century and early 20th century were uh, wealth inequality, the influence right. of money and no politics, um, and the system that he and other progressives of the time viewed as fixed in favor of big money corporations, and special interests. Sound familiar? <laughs> um, and, and what they were advocating, really, was not equality of outcomes, but equality of opportunity, so that everybody Good. was starting from the same starting line. Right. So when he was a U.S. congressman, he had uh, a life-changing experience in 1891. He was called into the office of U.S. Senator Felitas Sawyer, and Sawyer offered Fightin' Bob a retainer of sorts um, because his brother-in-law was trying a case right. of one of Sawyer's friends. And so he essentially offered La Follette a bribe. And La Follette turned down the bribe. His brother-in-law um, excused himself from the case and Fightin' Bob decided, so this is, this is the problem with politics. It's right. bribery, it's patronage. Right. It's uh, big money, buying elections, buying politicians, buying right. special interests, special favors. And he decided that he was going to spend the rest of his life fighting that. So he went back to Wisconsin and made speeches all over Wisconsin, everywhere he could, traveling around, delivering speeches against this corruption, against this influence, against special interests, and building up a reputation, which is when he ran for governor in 1900. Um, his, his big attack in Wisconsin was on the railroads at the time because the railroads were conspiring to fix prices and manipulating prices right. against farmers. So farmers right. were being victimized by these major special interests right. that were controlling prices. Um, they were doing this by colluding on the manipulation of prices and buying legislators with, by giving them free passes to the railroads, which is essentially a free rental car these days. I mean, <laughs> railroads were the only way to travel around, so you get a free pass to the railroad, you have free transportation for life, right? And that's what they would give to these legislators. So he ran for governor on the platform of... Um, stopping these special interests and holding a direct primary. All, all nominations in those days were through caucuses, conventions, essentially. And he wanted the people to have direct primaries and direct Good. votes. Good. So he ran for governor. He was reelected in 1904. Um, and part of his reelection effort was these roll calls against his fellow Republicans. He would go around reading how these people voted on different bills and holding their feet to the fire essentially to the citizens in speeches and part of his thing was he would have flyers with himself the candidate on one side and on the other side advocacy for a direct primary which had to be voted in by referendum of the people um, so it was the man on one side and the issue on the other on these campaign materials. And that was a big part of the progressive movement that he started in Wisconsin and brought to the nation really is these issues of referendum 
and recall and citizen initiative. Why where, don't we just define initiative and recall? Because those are technical terms. So an initiative is um, a matter brought before the people to vote on directly. Do we want marijuana, yes or no? <laughs> right, and the people bring this through petition to the ballot and then the people get to vote on it right. as one. It's small d democracy in action, really. Oh, okay. Um, and recall would be the people having the ability, and referendum for that matter, the people having the ability to vote themselves on stuff that's already been passed. Well, no, or, it's to kind of impeach the governor. Well, yeah, recall is. Yeah. Is on officials, call referendums back. on issues. Yeah. So, the impeachment was in the federal constitution. Right, but, but not. Not in for the states, for the governors. Not in the states, And all the, the other officials, the senators. Right. And these corrupt sheriffs down in Arizona, they want to recall him. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, these, so this was really trying to bring small d democracy to the American right. system, to the states in, in a big way. Right. Giving the people power. And remember, that's what he really stood for his entire career was power for the people against these interests. Well, that's what democracy is. Right, right. That's <laughs> what, yeah. Even though we, yeah, we're a constitutional republic, this is small-d democracy and bringing it into that right. republican system. Right. Um, and so he was also, therefore, a big advocate for the direct election of U.S. senators. Right. Because at this time, senators were elected yeah, by the individual that. state legislatures. The 13th Amendment. Right. Um, and and so because of this system of patronage and corruption, the state legislatures could be bought, and they would they would promote the person from within right. Um, right. to be U.S. senators. Right. So he through these efforts in 1904, he not only won re-election to the governorship, but he also won a progressive slate of candidates, a controlling majority in the Wisconsin right. legislature. So when a seat in the U.S. Senate became open in 1905, uh, La Follette put in his name to be elected senator. But once he was elected senator, he refused to leave the governor's office for 10 months until <laughs> the state legislature passed his program. Right. And he did. He stayed in the governorship and he, he stayed put until the state legislature passed his program and he didn't actually take up his office in the U.S. Senate until 1906. I see. Now, in the U.S. Senate, he was eventually voted in the 1950s one of the five greatest U.S. Senators of all time. He was, um, he was considered a master tactician. He did the same thing he did in Wisconsin. He did vote counting. He did data research. He used the filibuster right. um, to oppose legislation he didn't like, which is one of the times where the filibuster really started becoming a tool right. in the U.S. Senate. He was a progressive leader of a small, it wasn't a majority of progressives in the U.S. Senate at the time, but it was enough of a block of progressives that they could swing the right. vote on a lot of issues. So right. he had this power. He started the La Follette's magazine, as you mentioned, right. which right. eventually became the progressive. And he started giving speeches all around the nation. Um, he was an anti-war guy and he fought the Espionage Act, which right. jailed people like Eugene Debs and other right. anti-war right. demonstrators. And Victor Berger. <laughs> then Victor Berger. And he was for civil liberties. Now, this got him into a little bit of trouble himself because he gave a speech in St. Paul in 1917 where he was critical of World War I, the Great War, um, and the Associated Press. Uh, so what he said during that speech was, we have grievances against Germany, but not enough to go to war. What the Associated Press falsely reported was that he said, we have no grievances against Germany. Now in this atmosphere of war hysteria, um, this was seen as a, a horrible thing. Right. And there were threats on his life. Right. There were people who wanted him removed from his seat in the Senate. Um, and he and this was a great trouble for him. And right. people were attacking him from all sides. It wasn't until 1918 that the Associated Press actually corrected their error and apologized to him for getting it wrong. And not until 1919 that the U.S. Senate um, agreed that there are no grounds to remove him from his seat. Now, he, he tried to run for president multiple times. He tried to win the nomination in 1908, but Taft got it. He tried to win in 1912, um, but 
Taft got it again with Roosevelt, Roosevelt running on the Bull Moose platform. Right. And he eventually did run in 1924. Uh, his vice president was uh, the nominee was Burton Wheeler. He, he ran on the Progressive Party ticket. He faced Davis and Coolidge um, for the Republicans and Democrats, respectively, um, both of whom were fairly conservative. Uh, and remember, at this time, there were progressives and conservatives in both the Democratic and right. Republican Four parties. Party system. It wasn't. It wasn't all progressives, and yeah, right. That's in right. either party was. Um, but he, he actually, as you mentioned, he got 17 percent of the vote, which was more than Roosevelt got in 1912, and was the most, uh, the highest percentage of votes that any third party candidate got for president all the way until Ross Perot yeah. in 1992. Right. And he ended up dying in 1925, um, so that was his run for president in 1924 was kind of his last hurrah. But his influence um, continued to be felt, especially in Wisconsin, for the entire rest of the century. His sons brought forward a lot of his initiatives, and eventually, as you mentioned before, the U.S. Constitution was amended itself. Right to allow for the direct election of U.S. Senators. Very good. So that's my overview of well, fighting Bob Lafayette. You had a lot of interesting details that I overlooked. And one thing, one thing I want to be sure to mention is that he was known as, he was a great speaker. He was a great orator, and that's, that's what he did, um, really. He, in college at the University of Wisconsin, his main, his main, he actually didn't do so great on his law studies because he was too focused on delivering oratory and being a speaker. But there's one speech you can still view of him on YouTube. And it's kind of grainy, but you totally get the feel for what he's doing. And he's got his notes. And, you know, he, he barely looks at his notes. He uses them more of a weapon than, <laughs> than actually reading them. But it's a quote in the speech that you can see on YouTube. There's one quote that I always like to use anyway, so I'm glad that we actually have tape of it. Um, it's where he says that we must be aggressive for what is right in opposition to people who are aggressive for what is wrong. Good point. And um, it's, a, it's probably maybe a three minute, four minute video, but it's worth checking out on YouTube. One of the greatest statesmen and orators of American history and from the early 20th century, and you can still see him speaking on the internet today. Well, so. that's a fine job on Robert M. La Follette. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure I got that stuff in there Well, too. good. I was going to, as you predicted, talk about a, another progressive by the name of John Dewey, who got his BA degree in education at the University of Vermont in 1879. And he got his Ph.D. in psychology at Johns Hopkins University in 1884. In 1904, he moved to Columbia University's School of Education and taught there until his retirement. Dewey was able to advance a new progressive educational method by influencing the National Association of Education throughout the 48 state departments of education. After his retirement in 1931, Dewey continued to publish books until 1952 when he died. Dewey's philosophy put the student in the center of the classroom. At the elementary level, Dewey used the German-Swiss tutorial method well established at the university level in Europe in a more democratic setting in the United States. Dewey's idea of democracy can be traced back to the enlightenment of John Locke in 1688, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the major philosopher of the French Revolution of 1789. So before going on to that, do you have any uh, further questions or comments about the meaning of the progressives and socialists and liberals in America from 1895 to 1925? I guess you more well, or less anticipated that and yeah, wrapped yeah. it up. Uh, yeah, and, and we could talk about that some more. And I'd really like to 
draw the parallel to a lot of the issues that we're facing today. What, what the progressives saw was a corruption of the system. Right. They saw the entire American system as being controlled by special interests, right. by corporations, and right. by big money. Right. And I think that this can't be emphasized enough because what we see today with Citizens United and with McCutcheon right. and with um, unaccountable dark money being poured into right. our politics at right. extraordinary rates, Right. Uh, Thirty-three million dollars spent on behalf of Rob Portman last year in Ohio right. by super PACs, dark money, don't know where it's coming from, don't know who's buying these TV ads, but they're buying our elections yeah, and my... yielding influence. Um, we're seeing a lack of true representation of the interests of the people. Right. We're seeing uh, interests, the interests of private for-profit corporations being pushed over the interests of what's good for the citizens themselves. We're seeing uneven playing fields. We're seeing people giving a, given a leg up while others are left to flounder. Good. We're seeing conglomerates um, taking control over the political wheel of power. We're seeing people being left behind. Uh, and these are all echoes. We're seeing mass wealth and income inequality um, m greater than we saw during the first Gilded Age. Oh, sure. The, the wealth and income inequality no doubt about that. is much worse right now than it was in the 19th sure. century. Uh, we're seeing attacks. And now, uh, after the first progressive era, a lot of the victories that they won were for collective bargaining and right. unions and... Um, workers coming together to demand uh, their fair treatment. And what we're seeing now are special interests attacking and trying to roll back a lot of those things, trying to roll back um, union membership with right to work, trying to add funding a 50 state attack on public collective bargaining. Right. Um, so all these things are facing us once again, and I think that the American people are frustrated. I think that's what we saw in 2016, that people do feel like the system is rigged against them. Well, they, they're frustrated. They have, they, unfortunately, they have right-wing populists and left-wing populists. We, we do. And we have ignorant protesters on the right who know there's something wrong with the Democrats because they had voted for the Democrats in the past and things were getting bad. So they just vote the opposite party. I met a voter one time when I was campaigning for Congress. He said, are you the incumbent? And I said, no. And then he said, I'll vote for you. But if you get in, next time I'm voting against you. Voting he voted area. against any incumbent. He just hated all politicians. He just mm -hmm. wanted to keep the cycle going around. Right. So most uh, in 2016, most of the people who voted against the Democrats didn't know any history. They just voted against what they've been doing for the last right. 20, 30 years. It's just kind of a knee-jerk anti-establishment vote. Knee-jerk. But it's ill-considered because there are, you can distinguish, sure you can. and there, there are very big differences on but policy. But that takes work by journalists and historians it to does. point out the differences. It does, and we've got, we've got our work cut out for us because oh, yeah. right. we're all competing for people's attention and we're all competing for, people, for credibility, frankly, these right. days. Right. Um, but a lot of, I just want to note that a lot of these problems that faced us at the turn of last century are facing us again. In right. early in the 21st century. In spades, in double spades. Right, and uh, yeah, it's bigger, badder, and, uh, and much more um, right. harmful. And that's due to television. You see, in the 1890s, all you had was the newspapers. Mm -hmm. So television dumbs down the newspapers, and now we have cyberspace dumbs down the television. So right. we were getting dumber and dumber and dumber. You yeah. can't believe the conversations I've had with people who voted for Trump. Oh, I can only imagine. I used to think they had a mental age of 18. I've now concluded they have a mental age of 12. Yeah. They don't know simple logic. They don't know simple mathematics. Right. It's incredibly frustrating. <laughs> it isn't frustrating. It's just... To me, it is because I really deeply care about what's going to happen to the well, and even 
I care about and what's going to happen to okay, the people. But philosophically, you can leave the horse to water, but you can't make him drink. <laughs> That's okay. very true. All we can do is lead. Yeah. But we can't brainwash them with, with prison, and you can't put them in jail if they don't believe you. Right. <laughs> they just got to pay the price next four years. They will have a cut of their Medicare. The Medicare bills will go up, and some of them may wake up. Yes, we have an interruption. We got a break at halftime. Well, we've been talking about the meaning of progressive with Dave DeWitt, a practicing journalist, and Robert Whaley, a historian who's looked at the long run growth of democracy and progressivism, and also the short range decline of both. Hopefully, there'll be a recovery, but that remains to be seen. Well, anyway, I was going to go back now to 1789 when the United States and France launched the democratic revolutions, two of them, against the conservative monarchs of Europe. George Washington was a revolutionary general who won America's independence in 1783 and liberty for the American people. Benjamin Franklin from Pennsylvania was the intellectual father of America's constitutional system. One, Franklin served as the chair of the 1775 Continental Congress, which established the committee to appoint General George Washington as Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Congress. The 13 independent sovereign colonies were a Confederate type of government in a weak Continental Congress. Second big accomplishment of Franklin, he was the chair of a three-man committee with John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, who drafted the Declaration of Independence and adopted, which was adopted, on the 4th of July, 1776, by a majority of the 55 representatives from the 13 colonies who signed the Declaration of Independence. Benjamin Franklin had been campaigning for a Declaration of Independence, for a Declaration of Independence, through his newspapers since 1765. Benjamin Franklin designed a flag with a snake cut into 13 pieces with the slogan, Unite or Die. The Commonwealth of Pennsylvania called itself the Keystone State. It was the keystone between New York and New England to the north, with the southern states from Maryland south to Georgia. The third great accomplishment of Franklin was that he was the chair of the committee to persuade three quarters of the states to ratify the draft constitution finished in 1787. The state of Delaware, for economic reasons, and a satellite of Pennsylvania, was the first state to ratify the constitution. Wilmington, Delaware, was Pennsylvania's southern port on the mouth of the Delaware River as it entered the Delaware Bay from the Atlantic Ocean. The state of Delaware was the first state under Franklin's influence to ratify the Constitution. Pennsylvania was the second state to ratify the Constitution. The Constitution had to be ratified by three quarters of the states, which would be completed in 1789. Franklin was the chairman of the new committee, which drafted the present federal Constitution of 1787, which became law only in 1789, when three quarters of the states met the nine who ratified the draft constitution. The last big holdouts were from Virginia and New York, but officially New Hampshire was the ninth state to ratify the constitution. After that, the other quarter of states quickly joined the winning side. There was a big lot of debate about the status of the state of Rhode Island during the American Revolution. 
Rhode Island had a big seaport, Newport, which was controlled by the British fleet after and during the Battle of Yorktown, Virginia, in 1781. Some historians point out that Rhode Island, with its huge wealth, actually signed the Constitution secretly sometime in the 19th century. But Rhode Island was not ready to participate in the administration of the first, first six presidents of the United States. In 1789, the United States became the United States of America, a republic. The word democracy became popular in 1789 with the outbreak of the French Revolution. Thomas Jefferson believed in the spirit of democracy when he signed the Declaration of Independence. The French Revolution of 1789 was far more radical than the rather conservative American War of Independence. The British Empire and the new United States and the British monarchy were all influenced by the philosophy of the Enlightenment. In England, the major British philosopher was John Locke. In 1689, Locke's philosophy was very similar to Thomas Jefferson's preamble to the Constitution. Jefferson changed one word in Locke's philosophy, which was life, liberty, and property. Thomas Jefferson wrote, we hold these truths self-evident, that all men are created equal, and if they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Jefferson, who was also interested in reading science and geology and history and philosophy, having lived in France for a few years while negotiating for the French alliance, with the 13 colonies, he became enthusiastic about radical French philosophers. Those philosophies were mostly written before 1789, but inspired the political, religious, and constitutional and social revolution that broke out in Paris. For example, the major French philosophers undermined the Roman Catholic Church which was then an absolute monarchy. It undermined the absolute monarchy of Louis the 16th, the 14th, Louis the 14th. And the three radical philosophers were Denis Diderot, Voltaire, and Jean-Jacques Rousseau. There was one French philosopher who made very little impact in France, but it made a big impact in the United States. That was Baron Montesquieu, who inspired the United States Federal Republic of 13 states in 1789, which today has expanded to 60 states. Montesquieu's major work was called The Spirit of the Laws, published in 1748. The Federal Republic has the advantage of decentralizing power from the central government which prevents despots. The Electoral College in the United States is a major body in the American Constitution which checks the power of the popular vote. The first president of the United States, George Washington, was elected unanimously by the Electoral College. Can I jump in yeah, again here? go ahead. I just want to note, to kind of relate this back to what we were talking about uh, earlier, La Follette also vehemently opposed the Electoral College. Right. And wanted direct democracy for the election of the president as well. Right. And that's another thing that I want to note is very relevant to today, considering that in the past five elections, um, Republicans have won three of them while losing the popular vote um, four times. All right, so what? So I just I think that illustrates the advantage the the problems that we see with the electoral it, it, college. It, it, it advantages your personal political philosophy, mm -hmm. and your personal philosophy is that California and New York 
and Texas should dominate the other states. Well, I, my that is the problem of tyranny, the tyranny of the majority. I'm from Montesquieu. My, my, my problem <laughs> yeah, go ahead. is that I support one person, one vote. And what the but electoral... supposing that person is the, totally ignorant. What the electoral college does, I think that the, uh, the president of the United States should have to win the majority of votes of the that's population. That's your opinion. It is my opinion, and good. that's good enough for me, and that's good. what I'm expressing. Go ahead. My opinion. So I believe in one person, one vote. I believe that the presidency should be directly elected. We had, we had George W. Bush lose the popular vote in 2000, but he right. won the election. Now he did win the popular vote in 2004. Right, right. You're all right. In 2008, Barack Obama won the popular vote and won the election. In 2012, Barack Obama won the vote and won the popular election. In 2016, right. Donald Trump lost the popular vote but won the election. So what I'm saying is this, one person, one vote, the president of the United States in a general election should be required to win the majority of the popular vote. And finally, no, no citizen of any one state's vote should count more than the citizens of any other state. Right. Now, the, the argument that I run into with this usually is that, as you mentioned, Oh, doesn't that mean that California matters more, New York matters more, and people in Iowa or Nebraska matter less? Now, I, I say this. <laughs> I say that if you have a direct popular vote of the American president, everybody's vote counts the same because you're winning a majority of voters. The reason why we have primaries now is so that the candidates can go from state to state and court those individual votes and those individual interests in those states. So while in a general election, yeah, California, because they have more people, would be more influential. But in a primary election, that's the opportunity for these candidates to make their case to the different states and then they try to win their primary. If they can win their primary okay. by having the influence in these states, then so be it. All right, can I make a rebuttal? Absolutely. You have left out economics. Who buys the votes of California, Texas, and New York? Who has the campaign finance? Well, I'm How could I ever win Congress from the state of Ohio with $5,000 when it takes over a million dollars to even decide to run? So if you have your popular vote, there will be three states that will dominate the United States, California, New York, and Texas. And goodbye, Ohio. Ohio will decline to Nebraska. It will just be one of the other people who don't have any vote, financially, with money, plutocracy. Go ahead. Robert, why don't you uh, explain the electoral college? OK. The Electoral College is a body of sinecures. The people who run in the Electoral College have no power. You get appointed. But every state, after the 12th Amendment, the 12th Amendment gave the popular vote. The, 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 yeah, the 12th Amendment. The 12th Amendment said, you can't have the president and the vice president continually fight. The original Constitution said that Washington won the presidency and the second highest vote was Adams. So he automatically was elected. And then John Adams came third. Well, the problem is in the cabinet, Jefferson and Hamilton were continually at odds over ideology and ideas. Adams was a Democrat. Hamilton was an aristocrat. So the Washington's cabinet was ineffective. So they changed the law to say that in the future, the president will nominate the vice president so that the vice president will support the president until the president dies. Okay, so that's the way it's been working ever since the 12th Amendment. So the college, the guy who's at the college doesn't mean anything. It's the state law which says that if Ohio popular vote 
wins, that body has to vote the state of Ohio for the popular vote. However, there were three elections which had failed. The, 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 the election of 1824, John Adams. What happened in John Adams, it was a tie. <laughs> so they had to put it in the House of Representatives because Kentucky and Tennessee were rivals <laughs> and Henry Clay became very popular by throwing his vote to John Quincy Adams so that John Quincy Adams could be elected in the Electoral College. Well then Jackson got the Electoral College returned through the popular vote and he got the state of Tennessee, Alabama, Mississippi and all of the new states to have the popular vote. Well, by 19, 1833, the Federalist Party was dead because they didn't expand the suffrage. So population eventually gains. Okay, so that was the first tied election in 1824. Then in 1876, we had, again, the popular vote and the electoral vote disagreed because the North won the Civil War and they would, carpet baggers went down there and they stacked the legislature of South Carolina, Alabama, Mississippi with all blacks and it was the Republican army which protected them. So in 1876 there was a, a, a phony election through money and military occupation and the boats were only technical. So in the Hayes Tilden election, that was a recovery of that, in 1876, the Republican won the Electoral College, that was Hayes, and Tilden won the popular vote because he got the Northern Republicans from Buffalo and all of the Southern states. Well, the Southerners made a deal. They said, all right, we'll make a compromise. Hayes is president, the popular vote is, is, is the electoral vote is law, but we, our condition is you take that Republican carpetbagger army out. And from then on, it was the white Southern primary which dominated the South. So you always got to bring in money and race and economics, not just the vote. The total of the vote is only part of democracy. It's you got to look at plutocracy. You got to look at racial ethnic differences. They are part of the democratic body politic. It's more complicated. That's what I'm saying. And with the selling out of the 1876 election, we had a hundred years of Jim Crow laws. Wait and a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a South. second. But, Where did Jim Crow come from? But I, I would like to go back because <laughs> your your rebuttal assumes that I'm not in favor of campaign finance reform, which I absolutely am. I think that we need a very strong campaign finance reform law in this country. I think Citizens United and McCutcheon were travesties. And I think that the first key to curing the terrible illness of our democracy in America right now is starts and ends with campaign finance reform. But that does not excuse my position or change my position. While I believe in campaign finance reform, I also recognize the fact that in four out of the last five presidential elections, Republicans have lost the popular vote. You have said that three six times. times. You've said that six no, times. No, I've only said it once. Say it again. And they've I didn't won hear the it. okay. <laughs> I'll say it again. In four of the last five presidential elections, Republicans have lost the popular vote. And three of those times, they won the presidency. Okay, you've said now, it again. I don't believe that my vote, be, by dint of me living in the geographical area of Ohio, I don't think my vote is more valuable than a fellow American citizen who lives in any other state in this union. Wait a minute. How one did, person, one vote. How did we jump from your six elections to the state of Ohio. I didn't get that. Because in Ohio, our votes count more because of the way the Electoral College is set up. What do you mean they count more? They count more because we get the electoral votes compared to population 
You gotta our, have a mathematician. You gotta put this on paper. More this conversation than people is ended. who live ended. in California. If you don't know mathematics, we the, the discussion is over. I can show you the mathematics. Because we live in Ohio, and the way the electoral college works, our votes as citizens in Ohio count more than the votes of the citizens All right, what of is California. The Give me the number. Because of the electoral college. That's how it works, and that's why it's not one citizen, how many one votes vote right does now. United, how many votes are in Ohio? Because, and that's how Donald Trump can lose the popular vote by three million votes and still win All the election. All you do is give me the conclusion. Trump, 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 California, New York. I want to see the numbers on paper. End of discussion. <laughs> well, I can bring them up for Could you right you? now. All right, bring them up. All right. God. But my, I reiterate my point. One person, one vote. There's no reason that my vote in Ohio should count more the way the Electoral College works, than any other citizens vote in any other state. All right. I don't see that in mathematical terms at all. You have to write it on a piece of paper. All right. Presidential elections, the vote power in all 50 states. Go ahead, go ahead. All right, hold on. It's going to take a second because I'm dealing with the Internet. I apologize for the dead air. Good. So, for instance, well, here's an article. For instance, voters in Wyoming, in Wyoming have 3.6 times the voting power that this person does in California because of the electoral college. That's a mathematical, it's a that's mathematical, a mathematical number that means nothing. In <laughs> practical politics, California and Texas have tremendous amount of financial power and Wyoming is down at the bottom. Yeah, but the way the electoral college works, yeah, the way the, the numbers citizens work. Uh, end of Wyoming discussion. End of discussion. Have more voting power, three point six times more voting power yeah. than the citizens that's of California. That's a mathematical exercise. Now that's not one person, one vote. That's one person, one, one vote. Person, one another vote person, three point six votes. The, we can cease discussion. End of the program. So, Robert, why do you uh, explain your reason? Why should our votes in Ohio count more than a citizen's vote in California? Um, you've said that six times. Now, can I give another point of view? Give another Please. point of view. We have two checks on power, the electoral college and the popular vote. And in 90% of the cases, the popular vote and the electoral vote agree. There were three peculiar elections, 1824, 1876, and the Trump, no, not the Trump, uh, in, 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 in Florida, uh, what was the one in, uh, 2000? Bush 43. Bush 43, the popular vote and the popular, the, the popular vote and the electoral vote disagreed. In other words, the Democrats won the popular vote, and the Republicans won by the electoral vote. And that was a conflict of, of the parties, a conflict of the Florida power in Florida and the national power. But it had nothing to do with one man vote. It, it didn't have anything to do with one man, one vote. All right, can I explain yeah, my point of view? Go ahead. The average electoral vote represents 436,000 people. All right, say that again. The average one vote in the electoral college, on average, all the states average together, represents 436,000 people. Right. But in each state, this is disparate. So, for instance, in Wyoming, there are 143,000 people for each of its three electoral votes. Yeah, I understand the numbers. In the states with the weakest votes are New York, Florida, and California. These states have one electoral college vote for around every 500,000 people. 
So your one vote in Wyoming is counting in a greater degree in the presidential election I'm under the Electoral College. David, I, I just want to interrupt. Wyoming's the least populated state in the United States. Right, and that's why it has well, the most voting power. But what has that got to power. do with power? What, what it has to do with power is that, in other words, one Wyoming voter has roughly the same vote power in the Electoral okay, College. Okay, everybody should vote in Wyoming. 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 I have more power four than the rest New of the Yorkers. states. And what I'm arguing is, is that the voting power of one vote in any state should be the same. And the only way to achieve that is through direct democracy election of the president yeah. and getting rid of the electoral college. So that one man, one voter, one vote. Instead of one Wyoming having four times the power of a New Yorker or a Californian. That's small d democracy to me. That's fairness. We got two minutes <coughs> remaining, Robert. You give you go a minute and David will go. <coughs> I can argue with a person who will tell me that Texas has more money and more power than Ohio because that makes common sense. But I cannot argue with a person who believes that a person who cheats and takes <coughs> one dollar from me and another guy takes a hundred dollars that the one dollar is a cheater and the hundred dollars is also a cheater. So I don't care what the mathematical figure is in Wyoming of, what is it, 275,000? That 275, One electoral college vote in my uh, Wyoming. That number means nothing in terms of practical life. Represents 143,000. Okay, you go to Wyoming. I'll stay in Ohio. <laughs> in California. Okay. That's One your number. electoral co college vote represents the votes of 500,000 voters. Doesn't mean that's anything. the math. No, that's the math. That's the they factual do? math. Uh, we so that means uh, that a Wyoming's voter, his vote counts 3.6 times more than the vote of a person in California. I find that unacceptable. I think that we should have one person, one vote. That's Robert, my position. Uh, I've got a ticket for you for Cheyenne, and uh, this is the conclusion of this program. Jesus. But as always, debate is the oxygen of democracy, I can as you say, and we've been having a debate here. Are we I'm against the Electoral College. You're for it. I'm We're not, both against I money and politics. I am not against the Electoral College. I'm not in That's favor of said. the popular vote. I think we need both. We need a Senate. We need a House of Representatives, we need a President, we need a balance of power. End of the discussion.